mm -hmm. with my hands, then you can introduce the entire thing, and that will be shot, film the first intro video, and after that we just do talk, you introduce video, video comes. So, okay, go. Um, hello, I'm Marisa Miller, and welcome to the COVID era live stream for Hotel Symbiogenesis, a collaborative project between Eindhoven's hypothetical studio and South Korean design matter. Hotel Symbiogenesis is one of the featured projects here at Temporary Art Center in Eindhoven for the exhibition What a Time to Be Alive running during Dutch Design Week. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the exhibition, and in a moment we're going to play the video of it, so you get to see a bit more. Um, at Hotel Symbiogenesis, the story, uh, it's the story of an island unfold that it unfolds in the near apocalyptic future, in which various animal species, including humans, coexist symbiotically in a speculative hotel room. There is a collection of artifacts made of fur and leather of fictional animals. So. Um, we can go ahead and play the, um, play the, uh, the video. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so right now we are going to talk more about the Hotel Symbiogenesis Project, how it came about through the collaborative methodologies of hypothetical studios and design matter, and the unique experience collaborating between South Korea and the Netherlands during the pandemic. So I am going to introduce you all to Noam young son. They are a member of Hypothetical Studios. And Noam, can you talk about how Hypothetical Studios was initially formed? Yes. <clears throat> so to begin with, the initial, initial concept of the project, which was to craft clothing, clothing materials that are speculatively derived from, from the fictional animals, um, was co-produced um, by me and Design Matters. Um, and one of the and this was um, one of the first few international collaboration 
than that Design Matter was doing. And as their collaborative partner, um, I wanted to use the amazing creative circle that I have in Inovin around me. Um, and by having that idea in mind, the um, formation of the group came very naturally. Um, so I was just lucky enough to have the talented designers that are involved in this project, including Karina San and Annabelle Po. Um, and they were within, within reach. So we all had very different um, artistic abilities, but we shared common interest in this topic of human and non-human coexistence. Um, yes, so the group was formed and we began to call ourselves Hypothetical Studios. And I want to note that it's not, um, it's not a single studio, but studios, the, pl the pl plural noun. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we are essentially a loose group of creative individuals um, that are highly autonomous, even though we are on the same page of the narrative. Um, and the method we used originates from various disciplines. So for instance, uh, um, in case of this project, my main medium was story writing, and I wrote like the initial story of the project. Mm, and that the same story was re reconstructed by Karina Son and Annabelle Poe in a very tangible way by crafting the skins and furs of the animals. And Ko De Beer, um, an Eindhoven based electronic musician, added another layer of information, another layer of, layer of information on top of it by um, augmenting the sound of the you know, fictional animals. Um, and that's what you heard in the beginning in the introduction video that we just watched. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say that these different layers um, doesn't necessarily conform to each other like mm -hmm. flawlessly, but um, yeah, we're cer certainly on the same page and we inspire each other and like open up more space for each you know, layer to move, to develop. Um, and yeah, so for instance, I, the story that I wrote was very much inspired by the you know, craft techniques that Annabelle and Karina could use. And I believe the same happened to their creative, pro to their creative process, vice versa. Um, yeah, and I th think that explains why we are calling ourselves hypothetical, because you know, it's the narrative that we're investigating is one of the hypothetical possibilities that we all like, created together. Mm -hmm. Starting with the myth that you yes. wrote. Okay, exactly. and then tell me a bit about uh, Design Matter and how how they um, like how did this collaboration happen between the South Korean Design Agency and an Eindhoven Collective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I like one of the major roles that I did in this project was to bridge Design Matter and Hypothetical Studios, and seen from that perspective, um, I think they're working their like core values are more like very similar in the sense that um, they induce creativity by facilitating interdisciplinary collaboration. So Design Matter introduces itself as a design studio consisting of designers, artists, educators, entrepreneurs, engineers, and programmers, which um, supports and curates the projects that explores sociocultural complexities and proposed possibilities for unseen solution. Okay. So looking back my you know, collaborative process with Design Matter, um, I think one of their co core value is to provide the creative infrastructure for the you know, independent initiatives like us um, through their international mul multidisciplinary network. Um, so for instance, for this project, for, for this project um, the conceptual development of this project wouldn't have been possible without the um, interdisciplinary feedbacks that they provide mm -hmm. that are coming from um, fashion designers, product designers, engineers, educators, fine artists, and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. like, it, it, was, it was a very eye-opening eye -opening exp experience to have that immense input from, that are not coming from my like, own field. And, what I also want to emphasize is that Design Matter uses their capacity of um, you know, making those relevant connections, not only for the, not only for the you know, 
creative professionals like in ca like the case of this exhibition, mm -hmm. but also for the educational pur educational pur purposes. Right. Um, so soon we'll be introducing the projects that are self-initiated by, the, by their interns that are in the 11th or 12th grade. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I saw that, I was pleasantly surprised that those projects were executed by the, by the high school students. And I, I, believe, and I, and I certainly believe that um, it was the you know, creative infrastructure that Design Matter provided which enabled um, you know, their, the, their ideas and imagination to bloom in that, like, in that like, professional way. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. The, then, then we're gonna go ahead and, and, and show these the video intros of each of these Design Matter interns yes. in just a moment. Um, this is kind of a, maybe a way to talk a bit more in depth about Design Matter's methodologies. So we've got these five conceptual design projects by interns covering um, human, non-human interactions, digital versus the real, um, other topics were facial emotions, industry waste, and uh, COVID-proof architecture. So the first video is going to be uh, the student So Young Koo with a project called Life Inside. And it's like Hotel Symbiosis, this project focuses on the symbiotic relationships between humans and non-humans. Cardboard is one of the most durable and environmentally conscious materials used in packaging and it is utilized in many different um, purposes. However, despite all the benefits, the sheer amount of cardboard that is being wasted is increasing by the minute. So although recycling is a respectable option, I wanted to find a way in reusing these single-use boxes to ensure that they are used as many times as it can before being discarded. In doing so, I wanted to integrate my endearment towards cats and create cardboard box shelters for the stray cats of my neighborhood. The stray cats must endure through the bitter cold of the winter and the rain, so the goal of my shelter will be to create something that can inspire the neighborhood to share their resources like food and styrofoam with the cats uh, that are using the boxes. To meet this goal, I have gathered cardboard boxes and explored many ideas in how to create the most suitable box for the stray cats. And I wanted the assembly to be quick, easy, and spacious. And I eventually ended up with the cardboard di box design that is created by folding two flaps of the cardboard box to create more space in the uh, opening of the shelter. It creates an opening that is narrow enough for the cat's privacy and is wide enough so that people can place blankets or food cans inside. I also focused on not creating any additional waste by cutting and detaching any parts of the cardboard. So this is because uh, that is against my original goal of reducing the amount of waste that is produced by the single waste, single used cardboard. After selecting the, how the box will be assembled, I needed tape to secure the flaps of the box and instead of using the typical clear tape, I decided to design a tape that clearly tells the people that this box is purposely placed for as a shelter for animals. This is important since people can mistakenly throw the box away. And creating the tape, I experimented with different background colors and fonts to make it as bold and eye-catching as possible. So my final design was a bright yellow tape with the repeating sequence of the words life inside and a cat icon. I chose to write life inside because I wanted the people to instantly be conscious and respectful of the cats that are living inside the box. I used the color combination of black and yellow because the people can instantly recognize the uh, colors as it is also used on the well-known caution tape. And 
it can instantly be registered as something that must be handled cautiously. After the complete assembly of the boxes, I placed them outside around my neighborhood to see the reaction of my feline neighbors. Through my project, I want the city community to understand that these creatures deserve respect and care despite the damage or inconvenience that they may pose on us because humans were the ones who created a stray cat population in the first place. I also wanted to show that simple waste products can be reused in a way that can be used to their fullest before they actually reach a state of disposal. I wish to see a community where city-dwelling animals and citizens can build mutual respect and uh, where they can coexist together. Okay, next up we have Nayan Kim's project, AR Identity, which explores virtual, virtual selves and the relationship between the digital and the real. Hi, I'm Jessica Kim, and I'm a senior at the Hotchkiss School, and I participated at Design Matter as an intern this year. As an artist, I strive to find new creative ways of expression, whether that might be trying new materials or including a refreshing idea of technology to my artwork. While other activities such as writing or playing a sport may have set guidelines, art has much more flexibility where the artist can choose its own rules for its artwork, tagging its own purpose to its creation. Therefore, I believe that as an artist, the one and only important duty given to me is to constantly challenge myself and bring change to such a diverse, variable industry. And this change that countless numbers of artists bring to the industry certainly motivates me. Using Photoshop, Rhino, Illustration, CAD, Keyshot, and so on, artists nowadays create a wide variety of artworks and even bring their virtual artworks to life through methods such as 3D printing. I'm especially inspired by how modern art is changing due to the developing technology, where artists are now also given virtual tools to expand their expressions. Reflection upon reflection is a combination of both in my interest in arts and technology. Most importantly, it embodies my growing interest in the virtual world. I've always found it fascinating how we call the world inside electronic devices as the virtual world, yet it resembles so many parts of the actual world we live in. Although we may switch from being Jessica to k.jessica223 at gmail.com, in the virtual world, our identity and personality stay the same. Our thoughts stay the same and our interests stay the same. For example, I enjoy eating delicious food in the actual world, and not so surprisingly, my YouTube history is full of full food videos. I perceive the virtual world as a reflection of the world we live in, and I believe that the virtual world also deserves to be called the virtual reality. I believe this accounts true for art as well. Through virtual programs like Photoshop and Rhino, we can bring to life in virtual reality what existed only in our imaginations. What's more amazing now is that through systems such as 3D printing, our animated imaginations created in virtual reality can be brought back to the actual reality we live in. I utilize these tools to reflect this relationship I found so engaging and affecting in all of our lives. The process of creating this piece of self represents this connection. I began with scanning myself with an AI app and moved on to the computer to create a 3D model of myself through programs such as Rhino and Keyshot. After successively bringing myself into virtual reality, I decided to bring my belongings with me, such as my computer and my phone. I also added tools that I often use, such as scissor and a mouse, and also included some emojis that I use in social media. After forming my circle in this virtual reality, I decided to print this 3D model of myself to bring myself back to the actual world. But simultaneously, I began to build an AR app that detects this 3D model and brings the virtual circle of my favorites and belongings around my model. The long process of going back and forth from the tangible and intangible world, I was able to experience the connection that I was trying to portray through this piece. And particularly, bringing technology to this artwork was me challenging myself to transform my abstract idea into a tangible and visible object that others could observe. Through creating this piece, I was able to pursue my duty as an artist to continuously take risks, and I was able to bring my interest to life. Thank you. Uh, 
have Jeho Kim's a fashion management project, and he is talking about how to increase the lifespan of clothing through customization. Hello, my name is Jeho Kim, a senior at Korea International School. I'm currently working on a project as an intern at Design Matter. This ongoing project is about creating a new experience in the fashion industry. Fast fashion industry has been one of the biggest issues regarding our environment, so that it has always been an uncomfortable area as a designer. We create products, but they are consumed almost too shortly and then being thrown away. I asked myself then, how can we change this as designers? This was always the basic question I had since the start of the project. I thought if customers are engaged in the part of the design process, and have more attachment to the outfit garment. It will help the customers enjoy the clothes more. So I came up with this outfit generator system that offers a user experience where one can partake in creating a digital outfit. Created by the user's choice of various data sets of images, which allows a personal attachment along with this process. The final creation will be decoded and examined by an AI program which will create a digital outfit. Once the garment is created in the virtual world, the 3D digital garments could be worn on a model in a walking mode, showing the flow and the movement of the garment under gravity. This allows the customers to have a sense of weight, texture, and the overall feeling of the product even without the actual product being made yet. Adding this experience of virtual reality in the fashion industry, it opens up new possibilities. First, digital garments can be presented and showcased in the Insta AR filter. Second, a digital try-on could be visualized on a customer's still image. Third, digital garments could be worn in VR chat, a social network game from Steam platform. And finally, customers will have an option to buy the real existing product, which has been capitalized from the digital one. This virtual world of garment can be a new playground for people who love fashion. The unlimitedness of virtual reality can turn up anyone into fashion icons. Throughout the whole process from digital creation to the consumption in virtual reality and eventually to the actual garment being produced will not only allow the customer to have a special bonding towards the garment itself, but can also offer the new experience in fashion, which was rather simple. Okay, so next up we have Rachel Lee, who created a manual for facial expression that she calls Mien. And this is something that looks at a visual emoji, dingbats kind of language that has a range of emotions that are more nuanced than everyday emojis. Hello, my name is Rachel Lee and I'm a junior. I'm currently in an internship program at the Design Matter. Um, when I was about eight years old, I had my new phone, my first phone. Um, it was a touch phone that only allowed me to call people, text people, take photos, and I only had two, two games and I was able to take photos and that was all. But as time passed by, I got my new smartphone and I was able to um, take more good quality photos and had some lots of games and I had internet, I was able to do FaceTime and I had new emoticons. But whenever new softwares were updated, I got to know that new emoticons would increase um, and those emoticons would be more specific and more detailed. But why are new emoticons added every software updates? And why do we need to send emoticons to friends and families when we text? Through simple text messages, although I try to express my feelings with words, I can't 100% um, and have my facial expression acknowledged by the opponent. What I really want to emphasize right now is that those similar but also kind of different emoticons kind of express different emotions. And the reason why I think that the designers um, basically just input that in the phone is because 
although we're together physically, we don't really understand if that person is smiling because if they are happy or if they're impressed about something or if they are just smiling without any reason. Through those kind of experiences that I went through um, by the past few years, I wanted to kind of experiment to myself or kind of make like similar but kind of different emoticons that kind of share my feelings, that kind of share my personal facial expressions and um, allow people to kind of know when I make those um, similar but different um, facial expressions at certain settings. So inspired by Paul Ekman and Scott McCloud, a cartoonist, and Paul Ekman is a psychologist. So eventually Paul Ekman has insisted that there are six universal facial expressions that um, a lot of people share in common and realize. So those six emotions are anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, and surprise. And based on those six expressions, um, Scott McCloud, a cartoonist, has added on to Paul Ekman's six basic facial expression theory and insisted that little modifications to six basic emotions could present many of the expressions we see every day. Moreover, by mixing the modifications McCloud um, have created, those, um, like, for instance, if I'm smiling and if another facial expression is like angry and if are if those two expressions are added together they express another facial expression so just like that it's like one plus one equals two so um more and more facial expressions are shown um inspired by paul ekman and scott mcleod's explanation from basic facial expressions to more complex expressions I wanted to create a manual that leads people to learn and express a variety of facial expressions and capture their emotions every day. Individuals' continents vary every second, minute, hour, and day. And in order to have people learn their new their new expressions, I thought um, if I share my personal facial expressions, um, they would learn more different, like expressions and would be allowed to express those emotions to other people and they might have different impressions based on those new um, experiences. So my design is called Mian. Mian is the most well-fit manual that helps people to practice a variety of expressions. Um, Mian is eventually defined as to um, be a person's look or manner that creates the individual's characteristic, which is my purpose of the design. The manual is to be placed in the bathroom because the bathroom is the general location everybody uses every morning to start the day off. If Mian is located in the bathroom, I thought people would be able to learn, practice new expressions, looking in the mirror as they spend their time to prepare for the day. And the bathroom is generally the place where everyone goes to like every morning, every night, or like even during the days. Depending on how one practices a certain facial expression, one's impression can alter and create their characteristic and personality. Mian is designed and presented through the bag, badge, calendar, poster, um, even the guidebook and the application design. Moving on to the specifics of my design, I created two logos, horizontal and vertical, based on my handwriting. I wanted to present a face image through the vertical logo and a typography design through the horizontal logo to set a balance and follow the purpose of Mian. Moreover, by creating various facial expressions and setting the designs as thin back fonts, the audience is able to utilize my ideas more easily. Next, the guidebook. The manual guidebook of Mian presents information of what certain expressions are and when the expression should be performed on a daily basis. The audience can use the facial expressions and most of all, the consumers can share, the, share their ideas of um, certain facial expressions. Um, the calendar, the poster, and the bag designs 
they have certain concepts that they kind of share along with each other. So basically, I wanted people to record their facial expressions and kind of show off what their emotions might be on that day. So there are badges for the bag. So whatever your emotion is of that day, you can just place a badge of the specific um, emoticon or the um, character of your emotion and then sh share your emotion to other people by um, having the bag around with you video and the poster itself as well have like a sticker on it that kind of shows people what emotion you should be or what facial expression you can contain today and learn it all from it so this was my overall project's concept design and purpose of um mian and my idea thank you Last up, we have Ryan Cho with Pod Nursing Home, and this is a proposal for a COVID-resistant living facilities for the elderly. Hi, I'm Ryan Cho and I'm a senior, and today I'm gonna to be talking about what I worked on as an intern for the Design Matter. With the spread of COVID-19, the world has obviously faced many problems, and one of that is nursing homes. According to a New York Times database, at least 77,000 residents and workers have died from the coronavirus at nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. As of September 16th, the virus has infected more than 479,000 people at some 19,000 facilities. While only 7% of the country's cases have occurred in long-term care facilities, deaths related to COVID-19 in these facilities account for about 40% of U.S. pandemic deaths. Protecting residents from COVID-19 and other viruses at nursing homes is a necessity, but many residents also fear disconnection and alienation. This project suggests a new design for nursing homes that prioritizes both physical and mental care for the elderly. Some key factors are 1. Residents with dementia have a harder time maintaining social distancing. 2. Staying connected socially is a vital aspect of nursing homes. And 3. Research has revealed that care workers who move around the facility can easily spread the virus. Therefore, I wanted to design a new sort of nursing home that improves nursing homes by introducing certain new ideas namely the mini pod that patients can move around in. The idea behind the project was that patients could be in a space that they can move around in to do their daily tasks and make interactions without fear of spread of the virus. Residents can only exit their individual rooms or pods using the room's mini pods. The mini pod allows residents to remain physically separate while interacting with others. At the same time, individual rooms have a separate entrance for healthcare workers and workers can sanitize before and after visits, along with changing their PPE. Each room has a secondary window that connects neighboring residents at the time of the nursing home's own program, such as game time or therapy, so that residents can actually be connected beyond the screen. The door to the worker's sanitizing room only opens with a permit card. This little room, which is the only way to get into the room for healthcare services, offers a place in which they can change their PPE. Every medical worker has a small sink and a locker to store their PPE products. When the mini-pod returns to the room, it is designed to fit into the charging deck, and the door of the mini-pod works as an entrance to the room. The mini-pod, a new imagining of the wheelchair in the post-COVID-19 era, allows for a new way of living together. Since many residents in nursing homes are very vulnerable, some are unable to wear a mask or keep distance from others. But this seamless change will automatically solve a lot of issues. The autonomous driving technology will not just take residents to the places that they want to go, but also ensure that they, they keep distance from others. These mini pods find the residents' rooms automatically when it's time for them to return. Family visiting is also a big part for the residents. Whoever walks into the building will first see the sinks and lockers to fully sanitize and cover themselves. And there's gonna be cameras to check fevers. Once they're fully ready, there's a secondary entrance door in which they can enter the reception area. The residents can travel to different floors, get to the kitchen, and even spend time with other, other residents. The residents can travel to the different floors, get to the kitchen, and even spend time with other residents. Workers with PPE will be there to help if needed. In this way, both workers and residents will stay safe while still gathering together and even eating together. Residents who need fresh air can also use their own balconies, as well as they can access the garden by parking their mini pods in one of four spots. There's only four spots to keep the space safe and easy for workers to control, 
there's a schedule for all residents so that they can have a chance to use the garden. We're facing new challenges as designers, but I believe that design matters for this new chapter does not change. Thank you for listening. Could have been amazing if they could um, virtually join the live Q&A after this, but unfortunately, you have to keep in mind that it's 4 a.m. in South Korea at the moment. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so that was what they sent us, just to talk a little bit about Design Matters Network and educational philosophy. And But now we're going to come back to Eindhoven and talk a little bit more about um, the collaboration here and really just focus on the exhibition. So if Noam, if you want to talk about Hotel Symbiogenesis um, and a little bit about the meaning behind yes. it, like why is it a hotel? Tell us like a little bit of details. Yeah, I mean, to begin with the question that you just asked about like why is the exhibition is hotel themed. Um, well, first of all, we needed a context um, to put to place the objects very naturally. And um, what I liked about the context of a hotel room is that it's like the it's one of the most um, temporal dwelling space, so that it um, so that it symbolizes the relationship between um, the planet and, and our species. So our presence in the ecosystem is inexorably e ephemeral, um, and like just like a traveler in a hotel room, and. Yeah, and furthermore, we intended a lot of elements in the exhibition, such as the island encapsulated, you know, in a in a dome, mm -hmm. or another geodesic dome that encapsul encapsulates the hotel room, like mm -hmm. to symbolize the planet that we're living in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the geodesic dome is one of the symbols, a symbol of the yeah, planet. And mm -hmm. Yeah, another one that is surrounding the the island in which the hotel is con is situated on. Okay, yeah. and then what about, well, you talked a earlier this week about the symbols of, of the color because everything is really bright, saturated green. Tell mm -hmm. me anything else about um, what that meant or any other symbols that are kind of running through the exhibition that would mm -hmm. be interesting to know well, about. What intrigued me about the color green was that, was the duality that it has as a color, like, which can also be seen from the emojis, like, like one, of, one of our interns like elaborated with their emoji project, that if you see the emojis that green symbolizes is either green or bacteria or ve venoms. Mm -hmm. So it, like on one hand, green means nature, whereas it also um, means like poisons and danger. And also like if you see the, um, you know, the micros microscopic renders of the coronavirus, you will discover that it's predominantly green. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's what's more fun is that even th even I mean those like um, electronic microscope images can is by nature is black and white because color is a concept that is coming from the frequency of frequency of visible ray, not electrons. So in in the end, all of those rendered images are the images that are arbitrarily painted by the scientists to indicate which part is which and they all ended up green. And I also relate this to the, to the you know, the duality as may, maybe, maybe people that, that are living back then related um, the, the symbolism of danger, mm -hmm. of color green from, um, from the from the danger and obscurity that nature has had to their to their daily living, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, like another aspect that we had about the color green was that um, I had an association with the green screen, which can be easily removed from like on Photoshop and can be filled up with you know another layer of content, and I think that was very relatable to the way that I was approaching the speculative text, mm -hmm. which wasn't like describing every detail of this, you know, word that I was trying to build, but rather it gave a lot of open, loose space in which, I mean, that can be infiltrated by the speculations of the, you know, collaborators or the per even the perceivers who are reading the stories. Mm -hmm. 
Um, as you're talking, I'm curious about the the part that you're planning in this, which is um, all these myths that you talked about. And I'm wondering if any of those myths would be interesting to share to for people because you have you were creating all these stories about different fictional animals, mm -hmm. and that was like the your kind of main. Um, one of the main contributions of, that you gave into the, this collaboration. Mm -hmm. Is there any, any, any one of those that you would like to describe? Mm, I think the last animal, which was the sea urchins, mm -hmm. um, was, kind of implies the conclusion that, I want, that we wanted to give by, by like building up the speculate, speculative world that is, is like a decomposer of the ecosystem mm -hmm. that you know, digest corpses. And during, during, their, during their process of eating the corpses, like the story was like that they store the DNAs of the dead cell into their cell, mm -hmm. which, and that ended up like those species functioning as, you know, the natural archive of the dead animals in, in that ecosystem. Yeah. And, yeah, that's that's how we concluded the story of the island. That mm -hmm. after having like a major um, ecological crisis, like um, it, the story concludes with the human human dwellers of the island like finding the traces of the animal species that has gone extinct from the sea urchin, mm -hmm. and that's why the video that you watched in the beginning like okay. concludes with the question like what species has gone extinct yesterday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm curious about you know. The way that in, in within this co collaboration, you were working with people in South Korea, but then also because of the pandemic, even more things happened. Like it, sh the pandemic and COVID shaped the collaboration mm -hmm. in a unique way. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, yes. So yeah, the 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 big the beginning of this project was shortly before the emergence of COVID-19 as a global pandemic. So it was a it was a I would say that it was a crisis for us when, when it just began. And that in, you know, it in inevitably reshaped the whole design process of it. Um, so for instance, one of the core members of our collective is still caught in Singapore because of the travel, restrict, tra travel restriction that they have. But then, so that changed the way that you... Um, yes. Yeah. So it's ironic, it's very ironic that um, the pandemic restricted the human travel globally, but it still made the transportation of the goods and trans transportation of the idea possible mm -hmm. so that the pro production of it had to spread all around the world to um because yeah that was because like the workshops and the you know production facilities around Eindhoven was closed when the pandemic right. has just started so it was spread all around the wo world including the cities like like Seoul Berlin East success in the UK, mm -hmm. um, Singapore, um, mm -hmm. which made the you know collective members more autonomous in their design process because they're like more like physically detached from each other. Mm -hmm. um, and one example of it was that what's I think the case of um, craft people that we encountered in Singapore. Like there were a lot of like very like original craft scene in Singapore, all, including. Rattan craftspeople, which made amazing um, frame for the room dividers and the lampshade that we have in our collection. Mm -hmm. And that also made us question about the um, colonial power relation of the design process. So like, pre, like I think pre-COVID world, world, there always has been like one side of the world that is you know, endless, endlessly producing design discourses. And on the other side of it, like there was just the other, that was like part of the world that, that was just possibly um, consuming all of those discourses that are, that are produced in you know, the Euro-American part of the world, I have to say. Um, but I think because, of the pan because this pandemic like, radically um, spread out the design in initiatives here all around the world, I think this could be a good moment to tip that hegemony that was kind of you know, dictated by, by the designs in here um, to the rest of the world. And I, I find the situation also very relatable when Bauhaus in, in um, Germany 
was dissolved by Nazi, by the Nazis, mm -hmm. so that their their mem their members had to spread all around the world, like to the U.S., to to Israel, to Japan, and they had to, they they made their like own editions, own, own versions of Bauhaus there, and like you know, con like sign significantly contributed to the establishment of their own design scene. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is a very, this could be a very pivotal moment of the way that, that we've been designing globally. And yeah, I'm, I'm not proposing our project as like the most ideal example, but at least this experience that we had could provide a very subtle hint for the rest of the design initiatives. I yeah, think. okay, great. Um, I know that we're, we're about to wrap up, but I still want to ask you um, maybe another couple questions. Well, I think that maybe to start, we can tell people how they can find out information mm -hmm. about the exhibition. So if people want to see more, more about the exhibition, if they want to see online, um, you can go to hotel-symbio.com. That's hotel yes, that S Y M B I O dot com. Did I do that right? Yes, it was. Okay, good. And then you, you and that anybody can come in person in Eindhoven to talk over the weekend and see the exhibition. Um, and then there's going to be a print book coming out about yes. it. Correct. Yes. So it can be yeah, it can be pre-ordered on our online exhibition platform as well. It's okay. scheduled to be first of all self-published in December, and then to find the right publisher afterward. To like, to have more editions of it, okay. it can be pre-ordered on our website. Okay. Okay. So, that sounds good. And then I guess to to wrap up, um, w just to kind of maybe give people a doggy bag of something mm -hmm. to to think about, or what was kind of talking about what was most important in the exhibition. Um, why explain why people should think about symbiosis? why symbiosis is so important and like how it will impact people that are watching. Mm, I think the COVID crisis that we're having showed that our species is not the, you know, divine, so impenetrable, Im impenetrable um, driver of this planet. Mm, so I just want to make people question by this, by this ex exhibition um, like what kind of relationship that they have been forming with the non-human -hum animals, not necessarily animal, non-human species, and maybe how sometimes one-sided or exploitative, exploitative it was. Yeah. Okay. Yes. No, um, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Th thank you for your moderation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. And I hope to see you guys at TAC this weekend.